my sister lives in London, and she's just got a new job uh, working for a company that designs rape alarms. And I always know when she's got a new job because she like she sends me free stuff. Um, so I used to get like cool EPs, and now I get loads of um, rape alarms. <laughs> Um, but it happened in this sort of quite traumatic package at the beginning of the last term. It was like this brown envelope, um, anonymous because she'd forgotten to label it, um, with like 30 rape alarms inside. And at first I thought it was like a really elaborate threat. <laughs> You're going to need 35 rape alarms for what I'm planning to do to you. <laughs> Evidently it wasn't. Um, they were prototypes and she wanted me to kind of like test them. Um, not in that way. <laughs> in the privacy of my room. And um, they're really, they're really weird objects. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but so their most popular model, right, um, the sound of the alarm is a sound of a woman screaming, which is stupid. That's literally the sound I can make without having to buy a product. <laughs> Um, it's also, incidentally, the only sound that we know doesn't deter a rapist, so... <laughs> um, they also make a minor sexual assault alarm, which is just the sound of all going, Hey! <laughs> um, but yeah, they're, they're also they're, they're designed quite badly, like... Um, so basically the, the mechanism is like it's a kind of it's a steel pin on a chain and you and you pull it out to, to set off the alarm. Um, but it's like quite badly designed because obviously a pin has like no resistance, so it's really easy to set off accidentally, which is obviously not ideal if it's a, a woman screaming. So um yeah, I just don't know why they why they did it that way. But then I thought, I guess if you're thinking about rape all day, maybe that is the mechanism that you that you'd come up with first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really, I'm really glad to have them. Like um, where I study, I study back in Cambridge, and it's quite a safe area, obviously. But um, there was this one guy that came to the fore, and uh, he was called the sort of Cambridge sex attacker um, by the press. Um, his gig was basically he'd sort of come up to women and then touch them inappropriately and then run away. Um, so as an attacker, more of like a courageous voyeur. <laughs> but. I thought kind of well, he kind of makes sense of that mechanism, right? Because maybe you're supposed to like pull out the pin and throw it after him like a kind of rape grenade. <laughs> <laughs> so he just turns around, there's this screaming banshee just flying towards him through the darkness. I think it's a pretty pretty good revenge. Um, but I was thinking like I've been I've been sort of paying attention to the, the kind of discourse that was going on lately about, about sexual assault and I think obviously there's this kind of prevailing idea that kind of victims are somehow complicit in their own rape if they're dressed kind of provocatively or, or they're out late at night or wearing heels or whatever. Um, on one level, obviously, that's a really kind of repugnant attitude, but I kind of thought that maybe they should design, like, it, on that logic, if it is the case that a rapist is just so attracted to a woman that they just can't hold it back, they should make, like, preventative rape alarms that just, like, announce really unattractive things about you. <laughs> So you'll be walking along the street and there'll be like a, a creepy guy and you'll just reach into your bag and pull it out and I'll say, I have crabs! <laughs> or like, um, I have genital warts. Or like, um, the movie Teeth was a biopic of my life. <laughs> <laughs>